And I hope everybody's enjoying Labor Day weekend. You guys had a good weekend so far? Yeah? Great. Well, I said last week at our campus that uh, uh, Labor Day is the official, or the unofficial start of fall. And so it is now and only now acceptable for you to pumpkin spice and apple cider your entire grocery cart. If you've already been sipping your PSL at Starbucks for a month, it's okay. We forgive you. Uh, summer forgives you. And at South Point, everybody is loved and accepted. So besides uh, pumpkin spice, what's your favorite thing about the fall? Maybe it's football, right? Friday night lights, college football, NFL. Anybody? All right. Um, how about the leaves changing? Maybe you're a, a leaf looker. You like to go out and see all that, right? That's always exciting. My wife loves that. Um, some of you already know what you're going to be for Halloween, what your dog's going to be for Halloween, right? Um, and then how about anybody a camper? Anybody like to go camping? Okay, the Squires, we don't camp. And the story I'm about to tell you will tell you why, uh, that we're not quite ready for that. We do love campfires. We set a lot of fires in our uh, fire pit. The house that we moved into had a nice area. And so um, our old house, we had one, but we only used it like once a year. But, but now fire pits are a year-round thing. In fact, we have a picture. Uh, this is a couple weeks ago. Even when it's like 118 degrees outside, because it's been like that for the last couple weeks, um, we love to go out to the campfire. Why? Because s'mores, right? It's, just, it's never a bad time for s'mores. And so uh, since we've started doing a lot of fires, I've had to get better at that, honestly. I am a, a Boy Scout dropout. Anybody else a Boy Scout dropout? I, I made it to fourth grade Weeblos, which I found out in my research is actually just Cub Scouts. So I didn't even make it. Uh, all the way there to where they, they, you get to play with fire and sharp objects like axes. I just, I didn't get to that part of the training. And so uh, a lot of times it was a challenge for me to get this fire started. And so I, I would get to the fire pit and I'd stack the wood up in the nice teepee like you see you're supposed to. And I'd stuff the newspaper in there because I've seen that done before, right? And you light it up and there's flames and it's beautiful. And you're like, I have created fire. And then it burns out, right? And then you try that again for like two or three more times. And then you do what all guys do. We go and get the lighter fluid, right? And then when the lighter fluid is gone, we get the WD-40. Anything with the flammable, the sign that's actually like, it's a flame with a giant no, that's what's great for my fires. Um, I, I grab that and torch at least the bark on the outside of the wood <laughs> until that simmers out and burns down, right? Now, over time, again, I've learned you need twigs and, and sticks and kindling. I understand science, so I've gotten better. Uh, but there's still challenges, right? When it, the wood's really wet and the kids want to go have s'mores, but it just rained, um, or you're out of newspaper and you go in your kitchen and you're like trying to find something to burn, right? You're like, oh, I don't need the electric bill. I pay that online. We'll throw that in there. And, and so I still challenge. I get, sometimes get challenged. Uh, and I, I end up with flame, but no fire. Flame but no fire. Does that, does that sound familiar to you? It happens in a lot of areas of our life, right? It happens in our relationships. Um, it doesn't have to necessarily be anything uh, scandalous or catastrophic. Just over time, the heat dies down. You lose that passion. You lose that spark. And it's cold. And it's confusing. Uh, or maybe your job or, or your, your business that you started in the beginning, it was all hustle and grind and grit and wake up and kick butt and go to sleep and do it again the next day. But over time, that fire in your belly, it just kind of dies down, doesn't it, right? There's flames, but no fire. Maybe it's just life as a whole. You just find yourself kind of worn down and beat down and you want to stay down. Uh, it's just hard to get up out of bed and you're jaded, and you're cynical. Maybe you've got the wanderlust, and you think, I just need to pick up and move. New city, new job, new friends, new relationships. Maybe you even thought about checking out and quitting on life completely, because you just, you just don't see a way forward. You don't know if you'll ever get back to feeling the way that you used to. Flames, but no fire. It happens with our relationship with God too, doesn't it? Right, like do you remember, uh, can you remember a time in your life when you were so fired up about Jesus, you were so excited about him that you like built him into regular conversation at the office? Your coworker's like, this is great coffee. And you're like, you know what else is great? Jesus, right? <laughs> or they're in the fire, they're uh, around the, 
the water cooler and they're talking about football and they're like, man, the Ravens are undefeated in the preseason. And you're like, A, it doesn't matter. And B, do you know who else is undefeated? Jesus, right? Because that's just what you are when you're excited and you're, you're, you're first fresh uh, with Jesus. But over time, right, a couple years in, you've been baptized, you've done the small group thing, maybe you volunteer on a service uh, ministry. And somewhere along the lines, maybe it's been weeks, maybe it's been months, uh, for some of us it's been years that we're just going through the motions. And so sure, occasionally a, a flame flares up in our life, right? We, we come to church and we hear a song that, that just resonates with our heart and there's a flame for a moment um, or there's something in the message that, that makes sense to us or we have a conversation, a God conversation that, that, that flame kind of perks up but then all of a sudden it's gone as quick as the newspaper. We're not sure what to do about it. And flames but no fire, it leaves us cold and confused. Maybe this, this God thing isn't even real. Like maybe, maybe this Jesus thing isn't worth giving my whole life to. Have you been there? Am I the only one? Is anybody there today? As we look at the scripture today, we're going to look and find that throughout the Bible, uh, God has represented, the, the, the presence of God is represented through fire. Uh, in, in the beginning in uh, Exodus, shortly into the, into the scriptures, God shows up to Moses through a burning bush, right? And the bush is on fire, but it's not actually burning up. And Moses recognizes and he says, this is holy ground. Like I am in the presence of God, right? And then later on, uh, after Moses tells Pharaoh to let his people go, they march through the Red Sea and they get into the desert and God takes from there and he shows up as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night and he leads them through the desert. And then when he comes to give the Ten Commandments, he comes as a raging fire because he wants to remind them that he's the God that loved them and saved them and rescued them, and he brought them out of their captivity. And as we move into the, the New Testament, um, we see that when the Holy Spirit came down in Acts 2, that, that it appeared as flames of fire over their head. Or that Hebrews 12 says that our God is a consuming, fill in the blank, fire. And then in Revelation, it says that when Jesus comes back, it won't be as the guy petting the sheep. It'll be with flaming fire, that our God is a consuming fire. And so lastly, we're going to look today at one more reference to Jesus and fire. It's, uh, it's actually two guys' response to running into Jesus while they're walking down the road on Easter Sunday. And so I'm going to paraphrase the account for, for the sake of time, but you can go back and read the entire eyewitness account in Luke 24. I'd encourage you to do that. Uh, and so the, the context is Jesus has been crucified, he's died, he's buried in a, in a borrowed tomb, and then God raises him from the dead, and uh, he, he is then, the scriptures tell us, he sticks around for 40 days. A lot of people just think like he raised from the dead and went straight to heaven. No, he stuck around for 40 days, and he appeared to over 500 people because he wanted his followers to know that he is who he says he is, and he does what he says he will do. And so he appears to these 500 people, and this is one of those accounts. Uh, it's two days after the crucifixion, and uh, they're, they're outside of Jerusalem. There's two guys they are walking from Jerusalem to a town called Emmaus, and it's about seven miles. And these two guys, they're, they're actually followers of Jesus, and so they're, they're frustrated and they're sad that their friend has been crucified. Um, they're confused. They're probably scared. And, and they're just not sure about the way forward. And, and while they're walking along the road, um, it says that, that Jesus actually comes up and starts walking with them. And this is the first Jedi mind trick because it says that they were kept from seeing who Jesus was. That even though he was their friend, he, they, didn't, they didn't see that it was Jesus. And so they're walking down the road together. Uh, and Jesus is kind of like, hey, what, what are you guys talking about? And they say, well, he kind of looks at them sideways. We're going to pick it up here. In uh, verse, all right, well, I'll tell you what, we're going to move on. So uh, they say, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? The translation is like, do you live under a rock? Do you not know what's going on around here? How could you not know? And, and so Jesus plays along, and I just imagine this, and Jesus is like, I don't know what happened. And so they explain to Jesus 
who Jesus was, that he was supposed to be the Messiah and the Savior. He was supposed to save the Jewish people from oppression uh, and, and how the religious leaders had crucified him. Uh, and, and how that morning, on Easter morning, that, that the women had gone to the tomb and found it empty. And they said that they saw Jesus there. But when the other people came to the tomb to see Jesus, he, he wasn't there anymore. And so they weren't sure what to believe about it. And so Jesus, again, you just see him nodding, going, that's, that's interesting. And so they continue the rest of the day, and they spend the rest of the day together as Jesus explains to them what the scriptures said about the Messiah and what, what he had to fulfill in order to fulfill the prophecies. Uh, and, and then they have this moment where they go to have a meal together, and Jesus breaks the bread, and they remember this moment where they broke bread with Jesus before, and it's like the light bulb goes off, and all of a sudden they know who Jesus is. And it says that in that moment, Jesus disappeared from them. And I walked you through that whole passage just to get to their response in verse 32. I do know verse 32. And it says this, were our hearts not burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scripture to us? Did our hearts not burn within us? Another translation says, were our hearts not set on fire? That when, that when we encounter Jesus, um, it's more than inspiration or encouragement that there's, there's this uh, overwhelming experience that happens that leaves us changed forever. And so if you're here this morning and you're a follower of Jesus, again, do you remember that feeling when you started, uh, that, that when you first experienced his power and his presence in your life? And isn't that a great description? Did your heart not burn within you? But then eventually, when we don't feed that fire, the fire cools, right? And so then we're left feeling confused and uncertain. And sometimes there's, there's, we actually resist the ongoing presence of God. And, and so uh, on the right side of your bulletin, I gave you a couple reasons why that might be, where it says fire resistant. Uh, maybe you're here today, and, and you're not a follower of Jesus, and you go, I don't know, man, this on fire for God things, it, it doesn't sound like it's for me. I don't know if that's something I want. Uh, that sounds like the crazy people drinking the Kool-Aid, right? And then maybe, uh, maybe you've been following Jesus for a while, but again, you're just not sure if you want to go all in. You're not sure what it would require of you if you allowed God to be fully present in your life. You're not sure, you're uncomfortable with the idea of what, that God might want something from you and for you than just behavior modification. And then most of us are going to fall into this last category, which is, is just, uh, we're, we're busy, and we're distracted. Like maybe again, like me, you're, you're raising a family and you're just trying to get through life and uh, uh, maybe you, you're taking online classes and uh, taking care of an aging parent, whatever it is that consumes your life. Um, you're just busy and you haven't intentionally ignored God on purpose. Um, you just can't remember the last time that you stopped and had a, a, a simple and honest prayer with God. You can't remember the last time um, that you pulled open your Bible or your Bible app and just read for a few minutes. You can't remember the last time you just went for a walk for 15 minutes and appreciated God's creation around you. And so we stumble through the weeks and the months and the years, uh, and the spiritual flames smolder, and they're barely holding on. As I say that, some of you can feel that, right? That you haven't fed the fire, and it's cold and uncomfortable. And the people around us, they can feel it too. That that intangible warmth that used to be there, it's not there anymore. And so we're cold and joyless. And so what we're going to go today is just what's, what's the alternative? What does it look like to have a heart that's on fire, to have a heart that's renewed uh, with the fire and excitement of God? If you're in your bulletin, uh, your first blank there, it says uh, that a heart on fire takes on God's character. Remember that, that fire represents God's presence with us. And so when the Spirit of God uh, is present in us, uh, his joy, his peace, his patience, all the good things in him just naturally flow out of us. And, and it doesn't have to be um, this great effort. It just naturally happens. It oozes out of us, right? Uh, because it's not behavior modification. It's life transformation. That's something in us has actually changed. And you've met people like this, people that just love people that are difficult and, and frustrating and don't deserve it. They just live with this courageous Kindness. It's because it just kind of overflows uh, from the character of God. Secondly, a heart on fire 
and this one isn't as popular or feel good, is that a heart on fire lives with conviction and yields to God's truth. Um, this one's hard because there's a little bit of rebel in all of us, right? Like even those of us who look like good Christians on the outside, uh, it's easier to live by our own rules than to submit to God and believe that his way is actually best uh, and that there's a reason that he lays this out for us. Conviction also means that, uh, that we are aligned with what God cares about, that a heart on fire uh, cares about the things that God cares about. And so justice and reconciliation, they're not just hashtags or political talking points. Um, it's the very heart of God uh, reaching out to make right what is wrong. On that first John 3, it says this, that the son of man, that Jesus came uh, to undo the works of the enemy. And a heart on fire for God wants to be a part of that and allows God to burn away first within us um, the lies that we believed and, and the things that are broken within us so that then we can help others move forward and be aligned and reconciled with their heavenly father. And then thirdly, a heart on fire changes at its core. It's not just inspired or encouraged in the moment. It changes at its core. Um, the reality is that each of us have to decide how much access we're going to give God uh, into our lives. And Johnny talked about this idea last week of the backstage pass. And we each have to decide if we're going to go all in and, and allow God to, to access every part of our lives because we can't have true change and freedom and experience all that God wants for us um, if we're holding back from him. We all know people that have hung around, that have been in church for 40 years, but haven't experienced life change because um, they've been around God, but they haven't allowed God to be in them. And so maybe it's terrifying for you to consider, again, what that could look like. Um, but it starts small, and fire just spreads. So it doesn't have to be an all-at-one explosion. And so how does it start? What are the conditions uh, to start the fire in our life, to see God do actual life change. Um, and so we're into the last part, which is first assess your direction. And this is where we're going to break out the, uh, the flip chart here. We're in Luke 18, and there's this really interesting story about Jesus. And there's two men uh, who go to the temple, they go to church, and one's a super religious guy. He's a Pharisee. It's his full-time job to be good at being good, right? And so uh, he, just, he has the right picture of what it looks like to follow God. Uh, and on the other side, we have, a, we have a tax collector. He is a cheater. He's a schmuck. Uh, he, he's just the kind of guy that makes you wonder, how does he sleep at night? And so we have these two parallels, and we pick it up in Luke 18. It says, two men went to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, one a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood by himself, and he prayed, God, thank you that I'm not like these other people robbers and evildoers and adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector is on the other side. Uh, and he says this, he wouldn't even look up to heaven, right? He's just broken before God. He won't even look up. Uh, and, he, and he says to God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. And I tell you, Jesus says that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And so here we're going to go to the flip chart, that, that here in the center, uh, we, we have the fire of God. And so usually at church, you want to not be near the fire, um, but today we're going we're to assess, like, where are we? That if, if the fire is the heart of God, if the fire is the, the renewal of God in our life, then where are you? And so for the Pharisee, man, he, he's pretty close, right? Like, he... he uh, tithes. He's not like those other guys who's, who cheat and, and uh, steal and sleep around. Like he, he's got it pretty good. So he's got to be pretty close to God. And then on the other side, we've got the, uh, the tax collector who's like just really honest about his life. It's broken. And so just take a minute in your bulletin on the right side of the bottom. Uh, it has this, this image. And I just want you to assess for yourself. Like I can't answer that for you. Just answer the question for yourself honestly. Uh, where are you as it relates to, to the heart of God? Are you, are you close to him? Does it look good on the outside? Um, are you walking with him? Like maybe you uh, volunteer here at the church or, uh, you know, you have been on mission trips or you read your Bible, like you're, you're pretty close. Or maybe you would say, hey, you know what? My, um, uh, my addiction, 
you know, puts me out here. I just, I just can't seem to, to get it right or, um, you know, whatever it is, you're just, you're far from God in this moment. Figure out where you are. All right? And then here's, here's the magic of the gospel, guys. Here's the scandalous grace. Here's the relationship over religion thing that Matt's been talking about. Is wherever you find yourself on this map, according to this passage, it doesn't actually matter that much. Uh, because here's what matters. This Pharisee, he looked good on the outside, right? But as he prayed, it revealed his heart. That he wasn't actually, his confidence wasn't in God. It was in his own good works. It was in his own comparison to other people. Go, man, I'm so glad I'm not like those other people. And so if, if we were to draw an arrow of the, the direction of his heart, it's trending, it's trending away, isn't it? Right? That, that the Pharisee looks good on the outside, but his heart is running from the Father. Now, now the tax collector, on the other hand, he knows he's broken and busted. He knows he needs Jesus. But his arrow, man, it is running towards the Father. It is running towards grace. It is running towards his goodness. And that's the heart of the Father for us today. It says that one of them went home justified, and it was this guy whose arrow was going towards the Father. Uh, so take a moment today and read again in Luke 15, the prodigal son. It's a story of a son who, who cashes out his inheritance, goes and lives wildly, and then wants to come home. And, and this idea of the arrow comes from there, that, that um, it says in verse 20, that while he was still a long way off, the father saw him, was filled with compassion, and he ran to him. He threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. Because it didn't matter how far he had gone, it didn't matter where he was on the map, it mattered the direction of his heart that he was open to being restored and renewed by his God. And the closer you are to the flame here, the harder this is for you to admit. Because when you're, when you're far off, like you know you need him, but when you're close, it's more subtle. It's that you're hiding from God in your shame and regret and your unmet expectations and whatever it is that's, that's keeping you back from experiencing all that God has for you. Um, and so assess where you are and wherever you are, point that arrow home. Uh, the next step is to clear out the distractions. And distractions, they don't have to be uh, terribly sinful. Uh, it, it's simply anything that consumes and wastes your time, your emotional energy, whatever it is that at the end of the day you wish you could have back. Maybe it's that fifth or sixth episode of whatever you're binging. Maybe it's the 12th hour in the office, maybe it's the 11th hour of sleep, that at the end of the day, you look back and go, I just don't know. Uh, man, I wish I would have used that time differently. It's a distraction from what God wants for you. And so I'm not saying you have to cut off your internet or quit your job. I'm just asking you to take an accounting of your day and, and, and look back at your day and go, how did I spend this day? Because it's, you can't say to God, like, hey, God, I really want to be close to you. I want to experience that fire in my heart again. And so if you could just meet me Sunday from 9.30 to 10.42, that'd be really great. I'll be there, right? We have to clear out some of the garbage and make room for the real fire. Um, my kids love throwing cardboard in the fire, right? Because it flares up and it gives heat and it's awesome looking, right? But then it goes away. And a lot of us, if we, if we take an accounting of our life, man, we're, we're fueling the fire with pizza boxes, just burning it up for a minute and then it dies out, and we miss out on the long, enduring uh, satisfaction of like hearty, seasoned oak that God provides for us. And some of our distractions, they really are harmful and nefarious, and we have to take them seriously. But to take steps to, to deal with what we've sought comfort in. Um, as, you, as you point your arrows and, in, and God invites you back home, uh, allow him into the, the muck and the mire and the real deal stuff in your life. Because um, I just had the sense as I was preparing this message um, that, there's, that there's somebody here today or watching online um, that's already given yourself permission for something. You've already bought the plane ticket. You've already sent the text. You've already worked on your backstory. And I believe that in this moment, 
uh, God, by his supernatural power, is just empowering you to say no and to break the chain. That as we clear out the distraction and we're courageous in that and honest with ourselves, that God can do something new in us. And then lastly, surrender daily. I'll be honest, like God can create a raging fire within you this morning, but more than likely, it's gonna start small and spread from there uh, through obedience. And so don't get discouraged. Uh, there's power that comes and momentum. Uh, our friends in recovery, they know this, that the, for those who struggle with addiction, uh, the want to never goes away. There's never a time where you go, well, I just don't wanna do that anymore. Um, it's always there. But over time, uh, your chances of success grow exponentially, right? The first year, only 20% people have, uh, have a success in sobriety. But by year five and six and beyond, um, those, those opportunities, those chances raise rapidly because there's power and momentum of daily sacrifice and daily commitment. And so my sin might not be as obvious um, or, or outward, um, but I am just as addicted to my own stuff as anybody else. And so if I'm gonna experience God's best, I have to surrender daily. And again, the closer you are to the flame in this picture, the harder it is for you to recognize your need for him. It takes humility. Um, I wanna have a fresh experience with God. And as, again, as I prepared this message, I came to the discovery that, that there are areas of my life where I'm living off of mountaintop experiences from five and 10 and 20 years ago. Um, and God wants to do a new work in us today. And so practically speaking, that means uh, making some time to actively engage with God, uh, maybe through traditional prayer of, of talking to God and, and hearing back from him. Uh, maybe it's using a, a phone app like Abide that does some like mindfulness meditation and, and scripture and allows me to focus on, on God and on his creation and on his mission for my life. Uh, maybe it's taken five minutes to read the, something from the Bible app instead of scrolling through Facebook for the eighth time. Like we've all done that where we're scrolling and we're like, we've seen this. Yep, like there's, there's nothing new there. Try something different. Take five minutes to hear from God. It could mean taking the risk to jump into a six to eight week small group that Elise is gonna talk about. This is a, a transferable principle it's, I've heard a couple times lately and I think it applies here. If you want what you've never had, you have to do what you've never done. If you want what you've never had, you have to do what you've never done. And so you don't have to become a monk. You don't have to like listen to all Christian music and uh, you know, be around all Christian people. But consider these daily practices uh, like the hot embers that keep the fire going, that even when the flame isn't as hot and as full as it used to be, that there's these embers that help you stay on track day to day. As we close, I just want to ask you to imagine for a minute, uh, what would it look like if you could get back to when you first started with God and you could feel that fire in your heart and that warmth in your soul and that, that security that God is with you? Um, how would it change the way that you live? You wouldn't be perfect. You might stumble, but you would be sure in your day-to-day -day that God is with you and his presence is for you. What would it look like if we were a church who together decided uh, to live this out? That when people see us, they see that glimmer in our eye and somehow they just know that it is a reflection of our heart that is on fire for the God of creation. Let's pray. God, I'm so grateful for you this morning and I feel like um, there was a, some great truth in here. I pray that, that you would uh, distill that in us as we reflect on what you're saying to us this morning. I pray that we would identify where we are with you, not just in our outward appearance, about the way it looks and what other people think about us, um, but where we actually are with you, that when we lay our head down at night, do we feel that warmth, uh, that, that confidence that you're with us? And so today, God, we, just, we release our posture and we stop holding back from you and we open our arms to you, God, and say, God, renew the fire within us. Light us up for your glory, God, and, and, and do amazing things. And I believe that just like the sun in the story, that it's not about where we are, it's about the direction of our heart, that as we, as we turn our direction towards you, that you run to us and you meet us, Father. Give us confidence 
and obedience to do what you tell us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.